Okay, so good morning, everybody. I have got a signal that we are ready to start. So let's start because time is running. So today I'll be speaking about uh, recent changes in the page cache and VFS. So basically the shared file system layer, the layer that's shared by all the file system. By the way, I'm Jan Kara from SUSE Labs working on the performance team. Uh, so basically I'll be talking about three things changes in the page cache, which has gone through uh, like significant amount of change in the last few years. Uh, then about some new system calls for handling basically file mounting of file system and some, some other stuff that you can do with file, syst uh, file systems. And finally, if we still have time, I'll speak about uh, some changes of block device handling and some hardening that has happened in that area in the kernel. So uh, about the page cache. Basically, all the, uh, the things that have motivated the changes in the page cache are that you know, the memory sizes are significantly growing, basically, in the last few decades. Uh, and the I.O. speeds have grown in the last decade very significantly as well with the advance of like, non-volatile memory, like you know, SSDs and stuff like this. Uh, but the memory is still managed in like four kilobyte chunks, so-called pages. Yeah? At least the size is four kilobytes on x86. On other architectures, it can be different, but it doesn't really change the substance, or we'll talk about that a bit later, about the details here. Now, the overhead of handling like the memory in such relatively small parts, like four kilobyte parts, is actually adding up. And it's become, as the speeds are going basically faster with the hardware, the CPUs kind of cannot keep up. And so, so the, uh, the overhead is becoming more visible. And they are visible in several places. Like uh, one example is where this is visible is with the page faulting. So basically, if you access like memory, you know, some page is mapped there. Uh, the CPU has to remap the virtual address to the physical address. Now the more pages have, the larger is the pressure for this translation mechanism. Uh, like TLB is the cache that is actually helping with this translation, and this is visible. Also, like if you take a page fall, it means like uh, the CPU has basically is taking an exception, uh, and then you have to like find the page in the appropriate structure, you know, lock it, get some references to it. These are all atomic instructions, so they don't really scale really great if many CPUs are doing them. So. Uh, this is all adding like CPU overhead, which is very visible. Uh, and so, so this was actually first noticed. Uh, this, this is the first overhead that was noticed already quite a few years ago, and that was the motivation actually to add stuff like uh, anonymous, like huge pages and stuff like this. Uh, and we are also like, for example, when, when a page fault is hit in a memory mapped file, then what we already do for quite some time, like maybe 10 years, is that we will fill in the whole page table page with the pages we have in the page cache, basically, which would belong there. So, so we don't fold each page individually, but if we have the pages already cached in the page cache, we will fill them on. And this provides a significant speed up for, for some workloads that, that need a lot of these pages. Uh, but the overhead is also visible in the buffered I.O. path, where, again, we are basically doing all the buffered I.O. one page at a time. Uh, and so, again, the lookup of individual pages uh, and all this stuff is actually taking time. Uh, and it's visible because, uh, and it's visible by the fact that, for example, if you do direct I.O. these days, then you can achieve significantly higher I.O. speed than if you do buffered I.O. exactly because the CPU just cannot keep up with handling of the page cache operations, and doing the I.O. IO directly is actually much faster. Uh, another place where this, the overhead is visible is the uh, like memory reclaim. So again, basically, as the workload sizes are growing, you have to churn more, more pages in the memory. All the pages are, for example, organized in the least recently used list, basically a linked list of pages from which we reclaim uh, from which we have to reclaim pages we don't need and so to free up memory which we can then allocate. And again, as more and more pages are flowing through this list, the CPU cost of handling this list is growing up. Uh, so basically, the idea how to solve these problems is kind of simple. 
to, to handle memory in larger chunks than, than, than in single pages, yeah? in, in multi-page chunks. Now, some architectures have support for larger page size, for example, ARM or PowerPC, yeah? uh, but just choosing larger page size has its own downsides, about which I will speak in a bit. Uh, so it's often not flexible enough, actually, in, in quite some use cases. So what we are now doing uh, is, uh, or like, so basically the idea is, so let's handle some parts in larger chunks and some parts in still small four kilobyte chunks, yeah? And this is done for a long time already for anonymous memory. So uh, we have like huge pages which are on x86 uh, or which are basically already on the system boot, basically you have to set aside certain number of pages which are handled in like, for example, on x86 architecture, it is two megabyte chunks or one gigabyte, you have one gigabyte large pages. Uh, and this is good because it significantly reduces the TLB pressure because now basically the cache doesn't have to cache each individual four kilobyte page, but you cache the two megabyte chunks, I'll, so there is much less of them. Uh, but on the other hand, this is not really very flexible because, you know, on, on boot you have to know how many of these you need. Uh, so this is usable for stuff like databases where basically one application is taking up the whole machine. You already know in advance what's going to run them, how much you need for the system, how much you want to give to the database. Then you are able to do this setup, but, you know, for more let's say, flexible situation uh, for, or situation which, uh, where you don't have that much control, it is not really very usable. We have also transparent read pages uh, which address this. So, so basically this, this is the way to kind of uh, take physical chunk of four kilobyte pages which, which are physically contiguous and treat them as one two megabyte page uh, and they can be split on demand or again, put back together into a huge page, basically, when it is possible. Uh, but the downside is that this is only for anonymous memory, and also, basically, you either have four kilobytes or you have two megabytes, so it's rather coarse-grained. So the concept that has been recently implemented in memory management and also the page cache is the concept of Folio. So Folio is like kind of generalized, transparent, huge page. So uh, it's arbitrary chunk of physically contiguous pages, uh, which of which you have like power of two numbers. So you have one, two, four, eight, sixteen, and and so on. Basically, page, sim, uh, single pages. Uh, and under the mechanism, uh, under the hood, the mechanism basically how to link these pages together is the same for as for transparent huge pages. Uh, and these folios are then used basically in, in various areas of the kernel. So now basically we don't, uh, for example, for reclaim purposes on the reclaim lists, we don't track individual pages anymore, but we, we track these folios. So uh, if you allocate like larger, larger order, higher order chunk, then reclaim will track only this chunk and not, not each of pages in there. Also, uh, these folios are now in, can be inserted into the page cache. So basically, again, in page cache, you are now not, ha not having individual pages, but you can have larger chunks of physical memory, uh, these folios in the page cache. Uh, now, specifically for the page cache, you need not only the support in the generic layer and, and, the, uh, and the memory management, but you also need like, some support from the file system themselves. So first, this was implemented in TMPFS, which is in memory file system and kind of the most sensitive to this issue as well. Uh, but now it is also fully supported by XFS, uh, bcachefs, erofs, and AFS, which is a networking file systems networking file system. Uh, now, about the size of the folio. So larger the folios have not only the advantages of like lower overhead when handling them, but also downsides. And that is also the reason why actually uh, larger pages, like say 64 kilobyte pages on PowerPC are not always the good answer and are not flexible enough. So basically when you have 
larger, larger pages or larger folios, you have also larger memory overhead for sparse mappings. You know, imagine that, for example, you have a file and you would use like every second page in this file. Yeah, so every every second like four kilobyte in this file, uh, uh, page in this file. Now, if you would map the file using the folios, which are larger than one page, so say two page folios, then suddenly your memory overhead has gone, uh, grown twice. Yeah? You will need twice as much memory to actually map this file, and uh, it's completely wasted memory because you don't need these additional pages. And the larger the folio size, the higher this overhead can get. So that's why uh, that, that, so the mem and this is very visible in some of the workloads where simply the memory overhead is growing significantly as you increase uh, the, the folio size. Also, you have coarser grained like dirtiness tracking. So when you have like memory mapped file, for example, uh, you modify one byte in it, but this means that the whole folio actually gets dirty and has to be written back to disk. So if you have these workloads that like heavily use memory map files, uh, there is significant write amplification from using larger folios. And again, for some workloads, this is actually costing like 40, 50% of your performance very easily. Like for, for example, for some of the database workloads. Uh, also, uh, you have coarser grained activity tracking. So imagine if you have like some larger folio and part of the folio is hot and part of the folio isn't really used much, so it's cold. Now, in the old days, with the single page mappings, you would basically remove from memory, reclaim the part that is cold, because it's not very interesting to cache, and keep only the hot part. But now, you are keeping the whole large folio, because you don't know that actually it's only part of the folio that's hot and part that is cold. And so again, this basically, in practice, this is visible again as larger memory overhead, because you are not able to as efficiently evict uh, and reclaim, reclaim pages. So, so these are the downsides of tracking things in larger chunks, in larger folios. And so, so it is kind of crucial to select proper folio size. And this is actually where folios, folios are, have the advantage because basically you can have different, you can choose different folio size for different files or even within the same file you can have folios of, of very different sizes. Uh, Currently, the algorithm which is uh, picking the size of the folio for the file is uh, relatively simple. Like, uh, it's basically folio size of the folio is uh, picked on allocation and based on the alignment of the I/O request and the size. So, uh, basically, when you do read, then basically we do read ahead, which is standardly. Uh, half a megabyte, uh, and we will allocate the folio to basically underlie this half a megabyte uh, read ahead chunk. Now, this also depends on the alignment. It doesn't always have to be great, so, so sometimes we pick smaller folio sizes, but generally we try to pick this folio size to fit, to fit the I.O. size. Similarly, for writes, when we need to allocate pages in the page cache for write, we will allocate the folio to match the write size. Uh, we can also split folios in the page cache. Uh, currently, it happens only on truncate or when punching hole in the middle of a file. So uh, when this happens and the boundary is in the middle of a folio, we will split the folio into individual pages uh, and remove from memory the pages we don't need. Again, this is there basically to reduce the memory overhead that's coming from using larger folios. Uh, now, uh, there are some interesting performance benefits uh, out of this. So, uh, what has been observed is that there is like 6% reduction in the system overhead when compiling the kernel, uh, when you are using larger order folios. Uh, then the Linux test, uh, Linux zero day testing uh, done by Intel has noticed like significant improvements in these micro benchmarks, like uh, the first micro benchmark which got improvement by 240 uh, percent, is actually a single sparse file, and there are many processes which are, which have this sparse file mapped, and they are banging it like together. Uh, 
and there basically this is kind of the worst case yeah for, for, uh, because you have many processes uh, so so they are not sharing the address space each process has to map uh, uh, all or page fold all the pages in the file and they, uh, they are, they, the, the, all the processes are contending on fetching pages from the page, cache locking them, inserting them in their address spaces and so on. So it's like very heavy contention on the page cache and a uh, lot of cache bouncing between different address spaces and so on. Uh, the second uh, case which got like 65% improvements is basically the same principle but with threads. So now you have many threads which are, uh, which are Again, page folding on the same shared file. So in this case, at least they are sharing the address space. So once a single thread basically maps the page, then all the other can use this work. So there is less contention on the page cache in this case. And the 45% case is basically when you have processes and each process has its own individual file. So there basically the contention is completely gone. And the 45% benefit you see is simply uh, from the lower overhead for looking up pages, looking pages, and so on, from the fact that you are doing stuff in larger chunks. Uh, now, also people, uh, there are other uses of uh, folios. Uh, people toy with ideas like using, basically, constraining the smallest folio that can get, that can be used for a file, and using this so that you can support file systems where the block size is larger than page size. Because currently, basically, block size of the file system is limited to four kilobytes, uh, because that's the page size on x86 architecture. Or well, on the PowerPC, you can have, obviously, file system is larger block sizes. But on x86, you are limited to four kilobyte block size in a file system. With folios, in theory, you could support file systems with larger block sizes. Okay, so that was about the page cache. And now let's uh, have a look at the mount API. Uh, and basically changes in how we, uh, how we mount and file system and so on. So basically, this seems like kind of boring topic, but there is actually a surprising amount of things under the hood. <laughs> So uh, we have the, this mount system call that is there basically since, since day zero of Linux. Uh, and it has gone on only through a minimal amount of change. So basically you give it the source device. Let's now talk about standard, files, standard on disk file systems. So we give it a source device, basically target directory where the file system should be mounted, the type of the file system, uh, and then some flex, which are uh, and basically mount options which are partly stored in the flex and partly stored as a string in the data pointer. Now, uh, with the system call, like over the years, many problems have accumulated. Yeah? First, the thing is that we are not able to specify the target in a like, more open ad style, where you basically can specify directory as a file descriptor and you can specify then the, uh, the, result, uh, the target directory as like a, a relative path compared to this directory FD fi file descriptor. And this is actually crucial for some container workloads uh, to create like race-free ways to handle things. Uh, also, like there is this weird combination where some mount options are stored in the flex and some mount options are stored in the string. To add to the confusion, actually some of them can be specified in both. Like so. so, for example, lazy time mount option can be specified both as a string and it has also a flag. Now, this somehow is kind of difficult to handle when these are not quite consistent together. Uh, also, uh, some of the flags uh, or some of the mount options actually influence how the whole file system behaves. Some of them behave, uh, some of them change only how, how a particular mount point behaves. So. Uh, this is basically, we are not used to think about it, but you know, you, you have file system and in Linux, you can have it mounted in multiple places. Uh, so you have multiple mount points for the file system. And this is used very much, again, in the containers and so on, which usually create their, each container has their own view into the file system. And so some of the mount option influence only the particular mount point, and some of them like influence all the mount points. Uh, so it is again like messy <laughs> what actually is going to happen. Uh, finally, uh, like we have run out of space actually in the mount flex. Uh, and 
uh, also there is this <laughs> interesting thing, so it's interesting like uh, adventure uh, in the API design. So originally the uh, the system, the mount system call didn't have the mount flex argument. Yeah, it only had the string data. Now around 1.0 uh, Linux kernel 1.0, somebody realized that mount flex would be probably a good idea. So this additional argument to the system call has been added, uh, but they didn't change the system call number or anything. Yeah? Uh, so now you have user space which is calling it with like four arguments and some user space which is calling it with five arguments. Uh, and so uh, how they solved it is that like upper two bytes of the mount flex have the like magical value from which you like find out whether this is the pointer or this is actually the flex value. Uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, and so, so we have this, and then like later even like in 2.4 times we have decided that the magic value is not needed anymore, but we still, so, so you can actually have useful flex in those upper two bytes because we like needed more flex. Uh, but still you have to check whether the upper combination of the flex isn't exactly the magic value because then it could be like, like as the application, fun stuff. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so, sorry? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and, and finally, uh, another problem that, that, is, uh, that has been like there is that the str string of mount options is limited to four kilobytes, basically, uh, which, is, which seems like enough, but for like some, for especially network file systems need to pass a lot of context into the mount system call because they establish like secured uh, communication with other other systems, so they need to pass in like various keys and so on, and then like four kilobytes are not really enough. Uh, all, also, there is sometimes the need to pass in like more complex data types, like pre, uh, like network connections, which already has gone through some pre-authentication, like you know, exchange in user space and so on. So uh, this is this was like mostly impossible to pass into the kernel through the mount system call. So, uh, and we have other confusion, but I will not spend time on this. Like, we'll see it a bit later in detail. Uh, so, uh, we have this new mount API, uh, which was actually merged into the kernel six years ago. But uh, after the patches got merged, the developer kind of lost interest and moved on other stuff. So, the support for the user space counterpart in util Linux and stuff like this got, uh, got merged only like last year. Uh, and also there is like counterpart in each file system that needs to be done basically to uh, support the new features of this new mount API and that's still not implemented in some of the file systems. So it's kind of still, still conversion in progress in the kernel. But uh, at least like e ext4, xfs and, and some other file system are already converted. I think btrfs is still not converted, but it's work in progress, yeah? So, sorry? Oh, it's done, okay, great. Uh, so, uh, how, how the mount, new mount API uh, for, uh, looks uh, is that you have now these seven system calls and I will basically because uh, it's a lot of stuff and you would probably, it's kind of difficult to understand what each of them does in isolation. Let me go through some like common workloads or common workflows uh, and on that explain actually what, uh, what each system call is useful for. So if you want to mount a file system, then uh, you would start with an FS open system call, which basically returns you a file descriptor uh, and you pass it the file system type. The flex here are not interesting, they only specify, they are basically the standard flex for the file descriptor, like uh, close on exec and similar. Yeah. Uh, so FS Open will establish a connection to the file system driver or particle type, say to ext4 file system driver or to btrfs file system driver. Uh, and the file descriptor, you can also read from the file descriptor, and it is used for communicating the error messages back from the kernel. So you will get the standard like error number return code, but additionally you can get through this file descriptor also the 
detailed error messages, which is useful, for example, for mount, because if you get E eval from mount, then it's sometimes very difficult to find out what has actually gone wrong. And you have to scrape the kernel logs and hope that there is something useful in there, uh, which is not like difficult to automate yeah, for, for some container runtimes and similar. So, uh, so here you can read, uh, you, so here the file script block can be used to passing back the error messages. Now, currently Util Linux just drops these messages on the floor, so <laughs> it's not really very useful. And you still have to scrape the kernel logs, yeah, as a bit of a spoiler. But in theory, at least the kernel part is there. Uh, the, uh, then, after you have this connection to the file system driver, you call basically FS config system call multiple times to add mount options to this file system context. Uh, so it's one call per one mount option. Uh, the type, you know, the, the FS config system call has the command parameter by which you specify what should like which which type of the mount option should be used. And we have there like five types uh, of mount options, like flag is kind of obvious, string is as well obvious. So it's like mount option that has parameter as a string. Uh, like in key, key is actually the name of the mount option and the value is, you know, say the optional string which is specified in the mount option. Path is essentially the same as a string, but the general infrastructure already resolves it into a particular, like, basically, in kernel internal representation of a path, and that, it pa that is passed into the, into the driver, file system driver, so it doesn't have to do the lookup itself. Binary blob is kind of obvious, and you can also fa uh, pass file system descri descriptors like this uh, in mount options. Uh, then there are, fsconfig has also two uh, other special commands. Like once you are done with adding all the mount options via the fsconfig, you call the fsconfig command create, and that will mount the file system. But now the mounting happens only inside the kernel, basically. Uh, it's still not visible to the user space. You just, uh, just in kernel, like for the file system folks in this room, basically the super block is created, the file system is called to load the data to the super block from the disk and stuff like this. So from the point of file, uh, in kernel file system driver, this is the mount operation. But externally, the, mount, uh, the mounted file system is still invisible. Now, after you have done this, you have to call the FS mount system call, and this will actually attach a mount point to the mounted super block. Uh, and you can specify the additional uh, additional like mount options, this ATTR flex. These are the mount options that are specific for this mount point only. So they do not influence how the super, the whole file system, but they influence uh, how this particular mount point uh, behaves. And, you know, it is stuff like read-only status, for example, that can be specified for each individual mount point, or whether the devices are allowed to be accessed through this mount point, that's, that's also like mount point specific flag. Okay, so now we have mount point attached, but still it's like anonymous mount point, and it's not like visible anywhere in the directory hierarchy. So then you have to use the move mount system call to actually attach this, uh, to attach this anonymous mount point, and you will actually get uh, out of the FS mount system call, you will get like file descriptor pointing to the root of the directory hierarchy now. Uh, it's just not attached anywhere to the global hierarchy visible by user space. And move mount will attach this you know, directory hierarchy into a particular place in the globally visible directory hierarchy. So after this attaching is done with the move mount system call, it is visible by users, the file system is visible by user space and can be accessed. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, so this I have been only speaking about. Now, uh, another flow 
is with remounting the file system, and it's using a bit different set of operations. So fspeak is basically, so originally we had fsopen, which created the file system context by connecting to the, uh, to the file system driver. This is another way to create file system context, but now from an existing file system. So you give a path basically to the fspeak, and it will return you the connection to the file system driver that's operating on that particular path, and also like it attaches the particular super block to this file system context. Now with fsconfig system calls, similarly as when mounting, you can specify the mount options. That's, is, that's the same. And once you are done with like specifying the mount options, then you call the command reconfigure, and that will apply the. That is the point where the new configured mount options are applied to the super block. Then you can optionally call the mount setter system call, which can modify the uh, per mount point mount options as well, and then you are done basically. So this is the remounting. Now, there are a couple of, uh, so these are basic, the basic operation every, every operations everybody knows about. Now, we have also some uh, inter, other interesting operations that you can do with mounts. You know, these are like the more tricky stuff which container runtimes often do. Uh, so, uh, like creating bind mounts and moving them in the directory hierarchy and so on. So basically you have here the open tree system call, which will uh, again return you a file descriptor that's basically, or the base version will return you the file descriptor pointing to a root of the file system. But more inter but you can do that with open add, so that's not very interesting. Uh, what is interesting is that you can specify additional mount, uh, additional flags, and then uh, the, you know, not only uh, the mount which is at that specified path will be cloned, so you will get like the, the second mount which is pointing to the same file system, uh, and the file descriptor returned will be pointing to this newly created clone, which is like anonymous, not attached anywhere in the directory hierarchy. And there is another option by which you can not clone not only this single mount where the path is pointing, but also all the, pa uh, all the mount points beneath. So you will get the whole tree of mounts cloned. So, and you will get back the file descriptor pointing to the root of this tree. And then you can use, uh, for example, move mount system call to move. Uh, uh, you can use move mount system call to like attach this anonymous mount point somewhere else uh, in the directory hierarchy, uh, or move the whole mount tree somewhere else in the directory tree. So, for example, when creating a container, you pick the mounts you want to be seen in the container, you clone them with an open tree, <coughs> and then you move them into the place where you are creating the container, and then you kind of uh, change route there or something like that, and, or, or create, you, you will do this, these days probably you will rather do this in a separate mount namespace, and then basically you will start the container there. Uh, so that's, uh, we have also like a flag with move mount with which you can like hide or with which you can move the anonymous mount underneath another mount. So you have one mount point and you will like on the same directory move another thing, but it will be like underneath it, so it's not visible. But as soon as you unmount the upper, files, upper mount point, then the lower one becomes visible. And this is used by the container runtimes to like atomically replace one mount by another so that user space cannot see uh, basically the intermediate state. Uh, there is also one interesting feature that's enabled by this, mostly by, by the mount set -ether system call, and that's ID mapping. You know, this is a problem often hit by the containers, but you have already uh, probably also seen it in practice yourself. So, you know, what happens with the containers is that you have like the common container image and all the containers are using it. But each container is getting like separate chunk of the space of the UIDs so that they cannot interfere with each other. Uh, but then when you have shared file system and the, like distinct 
UIDs. The problem is that, you know, for the UIDs stored on the file system are foreign for them, so they, you know, the permission checks really don't work because like they, they are not permitted to do anything with the file system, which is impractical. So container runtimes had to basically change the ownership for each container separately, you know, fork the original images and stuff like this. Now with ID mapping, you can basically change, uh, it, you can, it's like a remapping layer where each mount point, basically access through each mount point applies a different mapping function to the IDs. So the, as the, uh, so basically the applications accessing the file system through this particular mount point will like get them remapped to their own ID space, let's say, the ID space of that container. Uh, and if the container world isn't really, let's say, familiar to you, uh, you know, we have often hit this with removal me removable media as well. So, you know, imagine you have like ext4 file system or basically any other file system which properly imports, uh, implements uh, own file ownership and permission checks. You have it on, uh, you put this file system on a removable disk, removable disk and uh, then you attach it to, the, to a different machine where you have different UID for your user. And you are not able to use the file system because it belongs to a different user and you get EPERM for everything. Yeah? And now you could use ID mapping to actually remap on each machine the IDs on the disk to your own UID so that you can access the file system as the user. And so mount as a set, set editor is the way how to configure the ID mapping uh, for the mount. Uh, the mount must not be visible uh, in the like public directory hierarchy yet, so it can be used only for the anonymous mounts as created by the Open3 system call. And also you can only set the ID mapping once. So once the ID mapping is set, you cannot change it anymore. Okay. Uh, now, I'll quickly go through this slide. It's mostly interesting for the file system folks in the room. So, the new mount API, as I have now described from the user space, is uh, like also has its counterpart in the kernel. So, if you implement a file system driver, basically the FS open system call corresponds to like init FS context hook of the file system that gets called where it can prepare its structures basically for taking mount options and stuff like this. Then uh, the FS config system call adding mount options transforms to the parse param hook in the context operations. Then the uh, create command is transformed to the get tree hook in the file system command uh, in the uh, context operations and the reconfigure commands uh, of the FS config gets uh, transformed to the reconfigure hook. So this is this is kind of obvious. Uh, and uh, basically after this create or reconfigure command, the file system driver doesn't know about anything else because all the other operations like attaching to the directory hierarchy, configuring mount specific mount options and stuff like this, that's all completely handled within VFS and invisible to the file system driver. Okay, so I am now mostly running out of time, but uh, let me quickly sh share stuff about the block device handling. So basically the motivation behind the block device hand changes in the block device handling is uh, that file the block device can be changed while the file system is mounted on top of it, which leads on to all sorts of interesting kernel crashes because file system don't like expect this. And basically, if you can write to the mounted block device, it's kind of equivalent to arbitrary code execution, yeah, because file system just don't expect this. Uh, and uh, the bad thing is that actually writing to the mounted block device is used by some user space. Like in the old days, FSCK used to write to the root file system while it was mounted, yeah. if, uh, read only, but still. Uh, and st still some file system tools like tune E2FS 
do they modify the super block? For example, the label of the file system or UUID of the file system is modified by directly writing to the super block. Uh, so, so we cannot just trivially forbid this. Uh, it's practically impossible to like protect the data stored at rest because there are many ways to access the particular block on the block device. Yeah? Imagine various remapping done by device mapper where you can have multiple device mapper devices pointing to the same underlying block in the end or partitions essentially alias the same space on the block <coughs> device. And finally you have like various IOCTLs like SGIO which, by which you can issue IO to a particular place in the block device which goes completely. <laughs> around all the, uh, all the, uh, all the like, checkpoints, let's say. So, uh, but it is uh, quite easy to protect at least the buffer cache. So cached data of the block device, it is easy to protect. And that's actually interesting for the file systems because they can perform the checking of data consistency when loading the data from the storage into the buffer cache. And that's, that's usually enough. To stop at least the worst, uh, to stop at least the worst like offenders and crashes. Uh, so the idea is very simple. We basically uh, create a new flag when opening a block device from the kernel. So when file systems are opening a block device, we, they use this new flag, and uh, we don't allow any more any variable opens if this flag is specified. Uh, now this sounds simple. But in practice, it gets complicated uh, because it breaks some tools like mounting of loop devices in Utilinux that got fixed in the meantime, or resize E2FS, uh, which is still not fixed, but easy, to f easy enough to fix, let's say. But uh, in controlled environments, this can be already used. Uh, so currently, it's hidden behind a kconfig option. So in controlled environments, and for example, in Sysbot, they already use this. Uh, they have this already enabled. So Sysbot is not corrupting, not corrupting uh, device, uh, block devices under your file system anymore. OK, so I am out of time, and I'm mostly out of the talk as well. So thank you. And <laughs>